Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. In as many years as a commissario, Guido Brunetti has seen all manner of crime and known intuitively how to navigate the various pathways in his native city, Venice, to discover the person responsible. Now in the new novel, Transient Desires, the 30th novel in Don Leon's mystery series, he faces a heinous crime committed outside his jurisdiction. He's drawn in innocently enough. Two young American women have been badly injured in a boating accident, joy riding in the Laguna with two young Italians. The Brunetti novels explore myriad social issues facing the city of Venice with Venetian architecture, language, and food, taking pride of place as the characters grapple with crime solving. It is a wonderful pleasure to welcome Donna Leon to this week's book show. Thank you very much for being with us. What a great honor to have you. I'm in Massachusetts. It looks just like my house. <laughs> now, yeah. you you were at UMass for a while, correct? Yes. And originally from New Jersey, and then mm -hmm. and then you start setting off and, and to the world. Now you are in Switzerland. Of course, you write primarily about Venice. What brought you to the city of, of Venice? First, I went as a tourist in the, in the late 60s. And luckily, I made Venetian friends. I spoke a little bit of Italian, not much at all. But I, I met two Italians, a couple. Franco and Roberta, who are my best friends now. For over 50 years, we've become family. Because of their my friendship with them, I went back to Venice at least once a year for 20 years while I was, while I was just being an academic mercenary and roaming around the world and, and not doing much of anything except teach and have a lot of fun. And then finally, in 81, I decided that it was time to settle down, so I settled down in Venice. By then, I spoke Italian reasonably well, and I had lots of Venetian friends because I was—I'd spend a lot of time there. Each year, I would spend more and more time there. So, at what point after your arrival did you think of it as a place that would make a setting to a, a mystery series? Not until um, it was completely coincidental. I was at the the Opera House La Fenice with a friend of mine who was conducting there, and we were in the, his dressing room. He and his wife and I were chatting about this and that. They started talking badly about a, another conductor. And then there was an escalation. They were trying to figure out how to kill him. And I thought, well, what a great idea for a murder mystery that would be. I was, I was working on a dissertation for a couple of years on, on Jane Austen. So I, I was not really much interested in writing a murder mystery. But I thought, why well, not try that? Give it a pop. So I did it. I wrote the book. And then all I wanted to do was write it. So I, I just left it in a drawer until someone nagged me into sending it to a contest in Japan, which I won. And then I was given a contract by an American publisher for a second book. And so I thought, yeah, well, why not? It was fun to write the, the first one. Why not write the second one? <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm almost finished with the 31st one. Did you always think that even in writing the first one, that it could be a series, that there was enough no. there for you to no. propel it? I just wanted to see if I could write a book. Stop. And I could, I did. And the fact that it was published made me think, well, I, maybe I wrote a good book or at least a publishable book. They're, they're not being synonymous. It's, it's fun. I, I realized that this was a, an enormous way to have fun or a way to have enormous amounts of fun because you, you make people do what you want. You make them say clever things or bad things. And you, you pretty much, you, you push the world around. And that's what I've done for the last 30 years with these books. I've just made these, made these people do this and that and this and that. So let us talk about Guido Brunetti. And what a wonderful character and obviously a character that, that readers have come to love. And I assume that, that you have to have loved him for a long time to be able to yeah. do what you've been doing for as many years as you have. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I, when, I, when I wrote the first book, thinking that it would be one book, mm -hmm. I had the good sense to make him someone that I would want to spend however much time it would take to write a book. I had no idea whether it would be six months or six years. It turned out to take about nine months, nine or ten months. And I wanted someone with whom I could pass peacefully and pleasantly a certain amount of time. And so I made him intelligent, decent, 
cultured, well-dressed, um, a person who likes pleasure, who likes honesty, because these, these are qualities. And he, he's very, very clever. These are qualities that I admire in other people. And I thought, well, why not make, it, why not make him be a nice guy like Lou Archer in the, in the Ross McDonald books, mm -hmm. who's a decent man. And not like the ones who never can manage to, a relationship with a, a, a dog or a woman or a man or a parakeet who <laughs> drink too much and have problems with cigarettes, smoking and drug taking and, and, and women or men. It just, I just find them so tedious and uninteresting. Because I always ask myself, would I want to go to dinner with this character? Mm -hmm. And there are very few whom I would like to go to dinner with. Imagine spending your life with some of these people. Why? Why do you think that that people are interested in in spending time with with uh, not to disparage other writers and their characters, but but of, of obviously those books are still popular. That that people are interested in in that part of the crime genre as well. Yeah, sure. I, I think I think people are very interested in bad behavior because it's much more interesting than good behavior. This is one of the reasons why it's it's difficult to write books about good people because we associate goodness with, with being boring, which is not the case. The bad guys get the bad guy gets all the lines. <laughs> but you've made it fascinating to be to be a nice guy. Yeah, because and it, I think he's fascinating or interesting, not because he's a nice guy, but because he's an intelligent guy. Very intelligent. And so his his thoughts are not oh sweet harmony love blah 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 honey honey pie all of that stuff all the new age nonsense he's he's an intellectual and he thinks a lot and he puts things together and he's always dragging in the the books that he's read in the past he's he's a very literate man so that he'll he'll say yeah that happens in one of the greek tragedies or in one of the books where women were, were very, very badly treated, his point of reference for trying to understand what was going on was the Trojan women, because it's, a, it's a, a play that makes one understand the suffering of women for, mm. for many reasons. And I think that one of the attractions of Brumetti is that he is a person who has thought seriously about many of life's problems and doesn't respond to them with violence. And that thoughtfulness also is is not immediate. There's a brewing there too, right? There is a the thoughtfulness is is something that is on simmer hmm. often. Yeah, well, and it, and it's aided by the people around him. His wife is is an intellectual. She's a, a university professor. Not that they are synonymous either. <laughs> and he speaks to the, the circle of friends around him who are equally, in many cases, equally cultured, if I can use that word. Mm -hmm. is, his, is his reading list of the, of the classics similar to yours? Yeah, wh whatever I happen to be reading at the time. Artemidorus. The Interpretation of Dreams. The Interpretation of Dreams, yeah. It's very, very interesting. I found it interesting, and Brunetti will in the book, because Artemidorus thinks that dreams are going to tell us the future. Whereas in our society, people talk about dreams to try to interpret the past. And I find That's that such a, a, wonderful, a wonderful cultural difference. The ancients didn't sit around and say, well, I dreamt about a peanut butter sandwich last night. I wonder what, I bet that was when I was six years old and my mother, they just said, ah, oh, peanut butter sandwich. Maybe I'm going to have a peanut butter sandwich next week when I go to Athens. It seems to me that that you share that thoughtfulness as well, that, that you think things through. Well, aren't we supposed to? Well, we are supposed to, but as we well know, <laughs> some people shoot from the hip a little more than others. But also, I'm 78, and I think when, when one approaches that age, one should begin to think a bit about stuff. 
so that brings up the question of how this character has has age not being 78 but of of certainly in the books aging but still thoughtful maybe a little more melancholy if that Mm -hmm. is fair sure and that is part of aging i would assume and in his case it's part of living in venice because the the city is is gradually being destroyed is the culture is being ruined and people who love it i think can only view it with, with maybe not despair but with a certain amount of unhappiness. And the numbers are overwhelming in that there are 53, the last time I was there, there were 53,000 residents and 30, 30 million tourists. And so if you, were, if you grew up in a place that was beautiful and peaceful and where everything you looked at was beautiful, because that's the way Venice was up until about 15 years ago, and now to see it with, with streets that you can't walk in stuff that you wouldn't buy did that have to do with your decision to leave yeah oh yeah i left because i realized that when i left my apartment and started to go to buy bread to buy cheese to go visit a friend to have a coffee with a friend to go to dinner with them i had to wade through them as though i were Stanley and Livingston fighting off the, the wildebeest migration. The, the streets are in, impassable with people. L- literally, you have to wade through them, or you did. That's changed. I received a photo yesterday from a friend of mine who was out uh, rowing, and she sent me a photo from the Rialto all the way down the, the Grand Canal to the university, where, where it curves to the left. There was nothing. There was no boat, there was no human, there was no wave, there was no bird, nothing disturbed the calm of that. And I was spooked by it because I've never seen that in the 40 years, that 50 years almost that I, that I was there. I never saw that emptiness. If I'm reading, if I'm reading your books, I mean, you certainly have a, a very honest view of the city, but it is also mm-hmm. a very attractive view that would that would want me to go there to visit. Yeah. And but and yet that's part of the problem. So how do, how do we balance that? There's no way. There's no way. The city the city is in the hands of sort of metastasized capitalism. So everything that they think the the people who who run the city, the politicians who run the city is about ways of bringing more money into the city. And since it's a monoculture, only tourism really supports the city. They think in terms of bringing more tourists into the city because they think that that will make the city rich. I don't know that it does, mm. but I, that's, that's not, you can't take that out of, out of uh, a culture once it's been implanted. I'm, I'm very pessimistic about the city. That's another reason to move. Donna Leon is our guest. The new novel is Transient Desires. Leaving the city, I assume that's something that Bernetti would never do. No, 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 no. For a Venetian, it's devastating because they have their language. Mm-hmm. They have their, their family buried in, in the cemetery. Some years ago, I asked a friend of mine, just, just like that, because I, it, was, it came into my head, Lino, you know, how long has your family been Venetian? And he said, well, yeah. the record goes back to the 1200s, to the 13th century. His family has been living in that city eight or 900 years. And so I, I don't think that we can imagine the kind of bond that they have with it. And it's not, it's not nationalism. It's not the, the wave the flag patriotism. It's just a feeling that every stone in the city has a certain value. Every every window has a certain value. Also, it is one of the few places in the world where I've been where everything's beautiful. It's, it's overwhelming the city is so beautiful. So for a Venetian to leave it, I think is, is desperate, but they are leaving because of Airbnb, there's no place to live. You can't find an apartment either to buy or to rent. There's no work unless you want to work in tourism, and, and many of them don't. 
And so it, it's it's a chipping away, a grinding away at, at this fabric of people who speak their own language. 53, 55, 60 people, 60,000 people speak the Netsiyama, and that's dying. Oh, it's it's really grim to think about. And, and I'm not Venetian. I'm not Italian nor Venetian. So when it comes to the character, how are you able, I mean, you do in this book as well, but how are you able to discuss those issues and, and for you again to to be thoughtful to think about those issues along with along with Brunetti. I make them talk about them. I make them talk about the problems. Because that's that's how we learn things, listening to people talk. We don't we don't listen to lectures. We don't like to, we don't like to listen to, to someone who lectures us. But a conversation that becomes interesting can often be very, very informative. So Brunetti speaks to Vianello, or he speaks to Signorina Lecter, or he speaks to Papa. And uh, we learn about those people and about what's going on in the city by their conversation. Or when he talks to his kids, we learn his ideas about how one deals with children by, by what they mm. say to one another. And the books are, I, I would guess that maybe half of them is, is dialogue. I love the relationship between the family. There's much love, much respect. Yeah, well, they're a family and, and they're decent people and they have nice kids. <laughs> but that's here. I'm, I have to confess that that's sort of the template that I was raised with. I had nice parents and we liked one another. Leave alone all the parental child, filial love. Right. But we liked, we liked one another. And I think it's obvious in the book that, that Brunetti likes his children and the kids like their parents. They test your patience, but that's what kids are for. At the, <laughs> at the beginning of this novel, what, what did you want to explore? About three years ago, there was a, a story in Il Gazzettino, which is the greatest newspaper in the world. It puts the New York Times to shame. It reported that at three o'clock in the morning, two young men had come to the Ospedale Civile, to the, the, the emergency room, sort of dragging in these two wounded young American girls whom they left. They, they delivered them to the doctors and nurses and, and they disappeared in, the, in the, the searching around to find the doctors and the nurses and take care of these girls. And it didn't make much sense to me that, that someone would go to the trouble of taking these people to the hospital and then disappear. They took them in a boat. They arrived in a boat. And, I spent a long time thinking about that. And I, I finally realized that it would be a very good way to begin a novel because it's so strange. For people who are not Venetian, the idea that you drive the boat to the hospital is strange. To us, it's natural. But then I thought, why, why would they do that? Why would they not want to get involved with the cops? Which is what it came down to. And then that gave me a way to, to branch out onto something that has absolutely nothing to do with the idea of the boat or the accident. So it's, it's just a, it's a, an opening scene that doesn't lead to anything. It just shoves Brunetti forward in another direction. We're talking to Donna Leon, who is the author of the new book, Transient Desires. The book is published by the Atlantic Monthly Press. We have been talking about this particular book and I am curious as to, I know you're working on the 31st. You're almost finished with the 31st. Mm -hmm. how, how far do you plan ahead? How, how far do you look out? Well, I'm not much of a planner. I've never been much of a planner. In fact, I believe I never had a real job in my life. I, I always had transitory contracts. <laughs> No, I don't, I don't think I ever had a job where I knew, knew that I would have, or wanted, that I would have that same job the next year. So with Brunetti, I, I, the, all I can do is say that I will continue to write the books as long as it's fun. Because it's still now, it's, it, it, for me, it's great fun. And when it ceases to be that, I, I don't think I see any reason to do it. But even now, after 31 books, it's still great, great fun. What is the what is the fun part? Is it the research? Is it the writing? Is it all of it? Well, I have to confess. For me, the fun parts and the only parts I remember are the funny bits. So 
when I think of a certain book, I think of the scene where Brunetti walks into the office and Signorina Elettra is on the phone and she's very heated. She's in a heated discussion. And she says, I told you, sell the Volkswagen. And she slams the phone down. And he says, Signorina Elettra, I, you're a Venetian. Where do you keep your car? Are you selling your car? And she said, no, the stock. <laughs> has has crime fiction always been something you've been interested in and, and enjoyed i did when i was in university because if you spend your days either teaching or reading jane austen blake shelley dickens anyone at night you just you just can't you can't read more of that because you're exhausted by having read and thought about what you read. And crime fiction was a great way. It was like watching television. You just read the story. You just read the plot. And I found it very relaxing. So I, when I was there, when I was at UMass, I, I'm sure I eviscerated the crime section of the library. And I learned the tropes. I learned the, the patterns because the, you can see them in the Brunetti books. That, that there has to there has to be this element, there has to be that element, there has to be that element. And then there has to be a conclusion in which some suggestion is made that right will prevail in the world, maybe. In the in the Brunetti series, I, I realize that the maybe is getting louder with each book. The endings are becoming less and less ends. The books just stop because very often the reader doesn't know what's going to happen. Were you ever concerned about that, or was that very natural in no, its development? Life. Yes. Life. There's always there's always something that's going to change, and and I think that's changed most things. When we see closure or completion, I think we're we're deluding ourselves, we're calming ourselves, because the fact that life is so random is is perhaps not acceptable to some people. Is Brunetti is okay with that as you are. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because imagine not being okay with it. You would have no peace. And or he's a character have... that is at peace. To a certain degree, yeah, I think he is. Which says a lot about the character. It says a lot about you. But that is a that that is a state that that character could be in, and hopefully something that passes along to the readers as well, which I believe it does. I hope, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you do standalones? I did. I did one because. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, years ago, maybe twelve, fifteen years ago, I, I'm a good friend of of Chichilla. I'm a, I work a lot in the upper world. I have for the last twenty years, and I know a lot of singers. Cecilia, who is a good friend, said, Donna, I'd like you to work on a project with me. Will you? And I said, sure, Cecilia, just what do you want me to do? And I thought, well, cover notes for a, a CD or some, some appreciation of, of her, which I'd gladly write. Um, and she said, oh, good. I would like you to write own fiction, which means a novel. I said, Cecilia, come on. But she persuaded me. And so I wrote this book uh, called the Jewels of Paradise, which is about, and find me a more, I think, fascinating job in the world, a musicologist who comes to Venice in pursuit, yeah, this was the connection, in pursuit of, what's his name, Augustino Stefani, who was um, uh, a priest who spent a lot of time in Germany as a composer in residence at different, at, at different royal courts in Ducal courts in Germany. And I had great, great fun with it. It took, I don't know, it took six months, eight months to do it. But it's not but something I, you... I, I was going to do it. I said I'd do it, so I had to do it. <laughs> but it's not something you long to do. Many, many series writers say, oh, I, I must break away. It's something else that I, I would like to try. I want to take a break no. from that character for a moment. No, I know my limits. I know, I know what I know how to do. And other stuff, I don't, I just make a mess. <laughs> in, in the writing, does the writing ultimately come, come easy? Or do you, even as you're writing it, feel that it can be a mess and that you also can, can make it better? You're asking me at the right time. 
I've been working on this, this new book, 31, since September. And it wasn't until about two weeks ago that I knew what was going to happen. Because it's not knowing what is going to happen. The problem is how something will happen and why something will happen. Because it's easy enough to kill someone, but then you have to explain why someone wanted to kill him. And about two months, two weeks ago, it all, I was out walking in the snow and all of a sudden it just went as if someone, a, a, a chiropractor had just snapped my neck. And I thought, yeah, that, that's how, that's how. So now it's easy. Up until now, it's, it's just been sitting at the, sitting at the desk for a number of hours every day, getting a page or two pages or five pages. And, and now, now I just don't have enough time in the day to, to keep on going. And I'm, I'm optimistic that I'll have a first draft maybe by, by the middle of April. And then my editor gets to it and she is, is glorious. She's gloriously talented. <laughs> She's the one who will write back and say, Tom, did you realize that um, Brunetti has lunch three times in this day? Um, I got that busy with the action. <laughs> Turn the page and say, okay, it's Tuesday. Yesterday was Monday, now it's Tuesday. We're going to have lunch, a different lunch. Because when, when, you, when you have your nose in a, in a text or a story, you lose all perspective and all sense of time. I can never remember. The, the chronology of the book, even though, even though I haven't seen it. Yeah, here, here, look, there. That's chapters one to 26. There it one is. Happened in every page. Oh, makes a girl crazy, it does. <laughs> Donna Leon is our guest on this week's book show. The uh, new novel is Transient Desires. It is published by Atlantic Monthly Press. Donna, what a great pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. This program was a virtual event with Odyssey Bookshop in South Hadley, Massachusetts odysseybks.com. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program, bookmark us for next week, and thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donahue.